we were, are very lucky today to have uh, Dr. Tabor uh, here speaking with us, who's the author of a number of books, spent a lifetime uh, in, in, in academia and archaeology and and crossing over the nexus into being a, a practitioner in the field to investigate on faith and uh, who is the author of two books that, I, of multiple books, but the book uh, that the pretense for bringing him on here was Paul and Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and I just finished the Jesus Dynasty. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Tabor. Thank you for coming. It's really good to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. I, you're, you're, um, you're one of these, uh, I, I talk about Paul a lot on the, on the podcast, sort of joking with my evangelical buddies and, um, and how he opened the door uh, to, to uh, all the other faiths to come after uh, 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 his, his assertions of engaging with Jesus. And so I wanted to just take some time to, for, to, to kind of look at the book here, um, Paul and Jesus and and you know what was the why why was this a sexy subject for you to get into? Okay, well, I often say to my students, I've taught a course in Paul for years. I taught at Notre Dame, William and Mary, and UNC Charlotte, and I'm now officially retired, which means I'm busier than ever. And I guess the world is now my classroom because I've got a YouTube channel and all kinds of things that I'm doing, interviews like this. And so for me, it was a question of, uh, as I tell my students, I, I, I would make the case that Paul is the most influential human who's ever lived. Now, that's up for grabs because we could throw out Moses and Abraham and Muhammad and Jesus and the Buddha. But in terms of, you know, if you want to count numbers, when people say they're Christian, they would, of course, identify with Jesus. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. This is the confession of Christians, whether they're baptized as adults or children or whatever. So it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But when we think about the history of religions, the most influential documents, other than the Sermon on the Mount stuff, you know, the basic ethics, that would be shared by many faiths. Uh, you know, peace and nonviolence and caring for the poor and the meek and so forth. These things were not things that Jesus was uniquely putting forth. They essentially go back to the Hebrew prophets and principles of the Torah, of Abrahamic faith in general. But when you come to Paul, if you take his main letter, theological letter, it's called Romans, uh, that had such an influence in terms of setting the faith through figures like Augustine, the church father, the first one who probably really grasped Paul, because some of the early church fathers, as they're called, they tended to read Paul as an example of a hero of the faith. You know, he preached from east to west, and then he was martyred and probably beheaded by Nero. But if you say, well, what did he say? He doesn't seem to have that heavy influence until a bit later. So his letters are what are so powerful. So when I say he's the most influential, certainly not as in his own time. Uh, in fact, we're not even sure how influential he was because he, he travels through uh, what's now Turkey, Asia Minor, and Greece, and plants these little churches. But what we can tell from our archaeological records and other kinds of sources, these are small little beachheads in Greco-Roman cities. They're not taking over the world or anything like that. So he might have in his own time not have not been so influential. But now the letters, there are 13 letters with his name. And as scholars, we sort through that and generally come up with seven letters that are the earliest that we consider the authentic letters of Paul. Doesn't mean the others should be, you know, thrown in a rubbish bin or something, but they've probably been edited and theologized beyond what Paul himself might have thought by a Pauline school. This is pretty standard New Testament scholarship. 
So when I wrote this book, I tell the reader right at the first, Paul and Jesus, I'm confining myself to the seven letters almost as a methodological thing. In other words, if within the seven I find something, I think we can be sure that we're getting close to both the real Paul, you know, the historical Paul. Right, right. And remember, we don't have anything from Jesus other than what the Gospels attribute to him. And we have different versions in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sure. And, but with Paul, there's a chance to read, we think, first-person letters written from his own hand. I think uh, really not interpolated that much is my impression as I read them. I, I feel a personality there. It's a very complex personality, but after you've read them for years and years, as I have and taught them, you begin to kind of know the person who wrote the letters and pick up on him. And so he's so influential that there's a sense in which he could be called and has been called, not just by me, but many people, a kind of second founder is one way to say it. Right. You know, who really founded the religion that we now know as Christianity. Right. And it's right. common among the scholars to pretty well agree, and this shocks people, that, uh, well, what about Jesus? Wasn't he the founder? But if you put Jesus back into his Jewish context as a Davidic figure, according to Paul, he was of the line of David. And remember, Paul is our earliest source. I should point that out. You've read the book. I have a chapter called Reading the New Testament Backwards. So if you start with Matthew, you're a late comer. What you need to do is actually start with the earliest document we have, and that's a letter Paul wrote to a group that he founded at the Greek city of Thessalonica, Salonica today. Uh, you've probably been there. I've been there. Yeah. And... Uh, and and then move from there because we're getting an insight into the movement that would probably be 50 years earlier than anything we began to get in the Gospels. Uh, and so chronology is important. And the other point is that what we read in the Gospels is heavily influenced by Paul. And I think we can show that, particularly Mark. Uh, I teach a course online that people can look up. We'll put it in your description, probably, on creating Jesus. And it's a study of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is our actually our first Jesus story. And then Matthew and Luke use that. But Paul's before all of that. So the first assignment I give my students, and any of your listeners can try it out themselves, just open up the earliest Christian, in quotes, document we have of the movement, First Thessalonians, it's five chapters. Sit down and pretend you don't know anything about this guy, Paul, and read it. What do you get about the faith? You'll be amazed at what you get. It's not that Finnish edifice that we call the Christian church, but it's a very apocalyptic movement, a very end of the world, end of the age type movement. And Paul begins to talk about how Jesus of Nazareth has been resurrected. He's been exalted to heaven. And particularly that he's coming again very soon. And in his subsequent letters, he makes it clear that he thinks he will live to see the end. He even mentions that in 1 Thessalonians. But if you take another letter like the one he wrote to the Corinthians at Corinth in, in Greece today... Sure. Uh, that port city that was a sailor town and pretty wild place. He sets up a little group there. And we've got quite a bit of correspondence between him and that group. And we find that he tells people, look, in view of the present situation that we're in, the time of the end, he says, has grown not just short, but very short. You probably shouldn't even get married. <laughs> well, think about it. That's usually attributed to a kind of asceticism, like, oh, it's holier to be celibate and to be pure. Uh, and you find that in, say, Neoplatonist ideas uh, around the Greek world, that a really holy person would uh, be very frugal with their diet, possibly live a asexual life and so forth. But that's not what he says. 
says, look, if, if you need to get married, get married. But in view of the situation that we're in, so he's writing in the 50s, Jerusalem was destroyed 20 years later in the first Jewish Roman revolt. And then after the dust settles, we get our gospels and the church begins to emerge more. But what I'm really interested in is what some scholars have called the dark age of Christianity. And you probably shouldn't even call it Christianity, but let's call it the Jesus movement. And why is it called the dark age? Because what do we have from, G let's say Jesus, we usually date him around 30 CE or sure. AD on the Christian calendar. Yeah. Paul pops up around 50, okay? That's a decent amount of time. But that 20-year period, and really a 40-year period after that until Jerusalem is destroyed in 70, what's going on in that period? And what we find out, as you're well aware, because I know we've talked about this a bit, the dominant figure is not Paul. And guess what? It's not even Peter. Right, it's James, Everybody right? think it's Peter because of Matthew. Right. Where Matthew says, on this rock, I'll build my church, and you are Peter, and so forth, the foundation of, of Catholic perception. But if you go to Paul's letter, it's like you're getting behind the scenes. You're going back before all of those traditions were settled. And what does Paul say? He says, well, I did go to Jerusalem once I had my vision of Christ, and I met Peter, and I stayed with him for two weeks. So Imagine, this is very exciting to me that we get a letter from the ancient world with this kind of chatter about a trip and meeting Peter. That is so different from reading the figure of Peter in a drama like Mark, sure. where he's a character, but yeah. it's not him really, it's the story about him. So uh, imagine a meeting where Paul goes to Jerusalem, and we I think we can even locate where they met on Mount Zion because we know where the headquarters where James lived and so forth in Jerusalem today. And I've excavated and been involved in that area. So, you know, I don't find anything that says Peter was here. But imagine him meeting Peter for two weeks. And then he said, and then I met James, the Lord's brother. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's I taught nice. at Notre Dame, my first school, John. <laughs> <laughs> and I would uh, get into this, and immediately a hand would go up. Uh, three hands would go up in the class. Uh, Dr. Tabor, I didn't even know Jesus had brothers. Could it just mean like, you know, Brother John and Brother James and Brother this, like calling somebody brother, like many religious mm -hmm. groups do? I said, no, nah, you know, when you read it in context, everybody's a brother and a sister. But right. no, he, he says he, he met James, the brother of Jesus. Right, right. Who was in? Who was in the Sanhedrin? Who was? Who was? You know, it sort of the yeah, charge of the Jewish Jesus movement. Especially the Sanhedrin, but he was very revered. He might have been part of a more sectarian movement. But okay. Josephus, the Jewish historian, speaks of James and how important he was at the time, and he was actually killed by the same gang of high priests, uh, the Annas Mafia. I call them. There was a priest Annas in the early part of the first century before Jesus, when Jesus was just a kid, he had five sons then that were high priests. So he's running the show in the temple and it's a big, huge money-making machine. And it's very corrupt according to Jesus in the whole movement. Right. Remember Jesus calls the whole outfit a den of thieves. Right. And that actually translate more as a layer of, ravenous animals sure. literally yeah. it's not thieves like hey i took a little money and let's divide the loot it's actually you devour people and jesus said you devour widows houses things like that uh and he talks about the poor widow who gave two mites the famous widow's mite and he says that's more than all of this splendor and glory that you see here in the magnificent temple of herod Antip of herod the great rather and later Herod Antipas down there as well, the ruler of the Galilee. So he meets James, and this is amazing to think about. And then he names these, what he calls the so-called pillars of the church. This is the book of Galatians, Galatians, his most controversial letter. So if your listeners haven't read much of Paul and they just kind of heard about the church or gone to church or been associated with Christians, Try reading the letters, just get you a good modern translation. 
and try to read them without thinking this is part of the New Testament. But it's a letter that was written to an early community in the 50s. And what does he say? He says, well, I went up to Jerusalem and I met the so-called pillars of the church. The so uh, little sarcasm there. Sure. And then he says, what they are means nothing to me. Whoa, where are you going to hear that? I go to the Vatican and on my right, I see the huge statue of Paul. And on the left, I see the huge statue of Peter as you go up those broad steps into the Vatican. And I'm going, where's James? Right. right. There's no James. He should be in the middle there. And Paul shouldn't even be on the right. Uh, you should have John. So who are the pillars according to? See, we're going back in time. Yeah. It's almost like Paul's our time machine. I want to go back uh, to the year 40. I think Paul was probably, uh, we say converted, but it's yeah. probably not a good term because converted right. usually means like you change religions. He doesn't think he changed religion. He thinks he acknowledged right. he the, found the truth by Messiah. Yeah who he thought was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of God, is going to return with the angels of heaven to judge the world. That's what he believed. So if you think about it, these pillars that he calls them, and he says what they are means nothing to me, is not what you're going to have later. What you're going to have later is everybody's in line, everybody's harmonious. Mm -hmm. uh, but in those early letters, you get the idea that it's not so clear. And so Paul, what does he mean? What they are means nothing to me. What he says is, if they doubt my message or anything about the revelations that I have had. Now, this sets up an interesting dichotomy. It's the dynamic of my book, Paul and Jesus. And that is, we've got a group of apostles and James, the brother, who's actually put in charge we think even by Jesus before he dies. This is unknown to people, but we have really good records. I survey them in the book, and they're well known to scholars. This James, I believe, is a child of Mary. Some would say he's a cousin or a half brother, a step brother. Uh, you know that can be debated, but I think Mary had other children. As a historian, that's that's my approach. But anyway, whoever he was, he's called the brother of the Lord, meaning a family member. Sure. So and a trusted. A child of Joseph. Some yeah. say it's children. Of, the Roman Catholics say it's Joseph's brother, Clophus. In uh, either way, he's, he's the brother and he's in charge. And, you know, we have the Gospel of Thomas that was discovered in 1946 in the sands of Egypt. And the Gospel of Thomas, we knew about, but we didn't have it. And, you know, one of the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas is the apostles say, Lord, when you leave us, where will we go? We'll be like orphans. And he right. says, wherever James? you go, land or sea, go to James the just. Yeah. James the righteous one, literally. The Sadiq in Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, in other words, he's a, he's a holy man. Go to James the holy man. And then he says, for whom heaven and earth came to be, which is an odd expression in Hebrew. And what it means is that there are pillars of righteous people. I'm sure Islam has this too. Sure. Like why does God sustain the world? The world is so wicked. But why does he sustain the world? And in Jewish tradition, there's the Lamed Vavnik. There's the group, uh, that's uh, literally the number, right? Uh, and so... It's like half the Sanhedrin, so to speak, but this is the heavenly group. And the idea is that on earth there are these righteous ones that makes the world worthwhile. Right. The, so the idea is, yeah, yeah, for whom heaven and earth came to be, meaning the world's not worth anything unless there are some people who truly love God with all their hearts. So anyway, yeah. so he's the leader. And what Paul means is, if these guys who've been with Jesus, remember, we're talking about Peter, James, John, James maybe even grew up with him. Uh, they have from Jesus a certain tradition and approach directly in the flesh, so to speak. And then Paul says, uh, well, we no longer know Jesus after the flesh, as if knowing him in the spirit, as I tell my students, you know, like the latest word from heaven. 
Right. And Paul claims to talk to Jesus directly. He does. He right. claims, I wrote a, another book on Paul called Paul's Ascent to Paradise. He claims to have been taken to the highest heaven and to see, to have seen and viewed things. And remember, Jesus would be up there according to his faith. Sure. So there's a sense in which he says, look, I'm the last apostle, 13th apostle. I'm not worthy. But then he says, but I worked harder than them all. You know, he's got this personality, like, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, but. So, so he is putting himself above and below the other apostles. Below meaning, you know, I came late, I persecuted the group, I was wrong, I had to deeply repent. There's the possibility they might have even turned some people in and they were killed as martyrs. We're not sure of that. It's in the book of Acts, at least. Sure. But Acts is not Paul's letters. And then he, he, but he's above them in the sense that he says, you know what, though? If, if, if an angel from heaven comes and preaches anything different from what I'm preaching, literally, in it's let him be anathema, and that's to hell with him is what yeah, we yeah. say in English. To hell with him. In other words, just may he be cursed. Well, this is such a dogmatic statement. Think about it. That was the message I preached. He said, I didn't get it from men. Sure. I didn't get it through men. I got it as a revelation of Jesus Christ. But he means a, the heavenly Jesus, not the earthly Jesus, not the human being in the flesh who walked the earth. So all of a sudden, if Paul gets accepted and believed, which he was, of course, later by the church, by the third, fourth, fifth century, Paul is the theologian of the church all the way down into the modern times. He's the deep thinker. Who, right. And he has, he's a primary, it's primary source documentation. When I was studying history, it, you have direct line to what he was writing and saying, which is, right. which is sexy, right? You know, you have something that's tangible um, yeah. that, that, that it allows for uh, credit, not only really credibility, but it's, it's explicit. On what he's saying he just it, right. it doesn't he have to be interpreted right from him. you know yeah. right from him imagine if we had uh seven letters written by jesus himself and we felt that they were you know authentic and not interpolated and uh, they said all kinds of things you know maybe he wrote a letter to one of the apostles or he wrote a letter to a friend or anything you know i'm thinking this i'm thinking that it's that kind of material which historians just covet I mean, imagine if you're working on Abraham Lincoln and you've got all these official accounts and then somebody says, you know, I've got 20 or 30 letters from Lincoln during the war that have never been seen where he's writing several very important people. That would just, that would be a book. He'd be right. like, oh, well, this has to be redone because we've now got, so this is the trove that we have. Now, when we go to the book of Acts, and Paul is the hero in the book of Acts. Acts is after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Probably written by the same author as the person who wrote Luke, we think. It's kind of a volume two. But when you go to the book of Acts, Paul's a hero, but all of a sudden it's secondary Paul. It's not even the Paul. If you look at what he says and teaches, he's been domesticated all of a sudden. And he's very respectful of James. But what's clear in Acts is James is in charge, but he's not even introduced uh, as the Lord's brother or the one in charge. The first time he comes up is in uh, uh, in a major way in chapter 15, halfway through the book. And there's a big conference that's so important in terms of the movement. Do we accept Gentiles, non-Jews, into our movement sure. without <laughs> conversion to Judaism? Is, is it a Jewish movement that you join by believing in Jesus as the Messiah? Right. And what about the law? How, do, how does it yeah. do? Do we, do we of course. could Gentiles come as well and keep the Noahide laws, which would be much closer to Islam? You know, don't steal, don't lie, don't mm -hmm. be sexually moral and so forth. Don't be cruel to animals. Don't eat blood. Uh, the Judaism has preserved those as well as a system. And Judaism says the righteous of all nations have a part in the world to come. You don't have to be Jewish to, quote, be saved 
uh, although that's not normally the category you hear. But what James does in that meeting, Peter speaks, we have a record, Paul speaks, and then everybody's waiting. Well, what are we going to decide? James gets up like a judge in a court, and he, I, I picture him hitting the gavel, and he goes, brothers and sisters, my decision is that we do this, this, this. And he does decide that Gentiles can enter the movement without converting to Judaism, but they need to follow these basic laws of that go that are applicable to all human beings. In other words, the rabbis say there's 613 commands of the Torah, and most of those are not applicable to individuals in their everyday lives, but probably a couple hundred are if you're Jewish, if you're an observant Jew. Uh, but the seven laws of Noah are these categories of general morality that would basically apply to anyone, uh, any human being. You know, one creator God, uh, sexual morality, don't lie, don't steal. That sure, thing. sure. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, just basic. And that's what they decide. But the point is, James makes the decision. Peter doesn't get up and say, my decision is. So we got to reread the New Testament. And it turns out that Paul does yield to James. He realizes that James is in charge. And then, so what kind of an understanding do we have of the movement if we don't even know who James is? And it gives license to the to Gentiles, be, the, gen, the the Jewish Gentile movement, you know, which is different than the, the Jewish Jesus movement, right? The, the, it, it gives yeah. a license there. And, and Acts is interesting from a perspective of it kind of glosses over it, it's it's a document that's not that's not Pauline, but the it 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 talks about it's it's generated from that period, and then but it it, all, it even glosses over the forty days after the crucifixion, right? The uh, yeah, and Paul in Acts is the hero. It's it's more of the uh, it's an er, we we call it in Greek literature an eratology. It's yeah. praising Paul as the great apostle who takes the gospel to the Gentiles. But if you begin to look at what his sermons were that are recorded, you have a sermon in Acts 17, a sermon in Acts 13, and so forth. It's just standard uh, sort of Judeo-Christian uh, teaching. Sure. And it is in contrast to his letters, the vocabulary and everything else. I'm not saying it's another whole movement, but... What Paul causes us to do, I think, is to ask, if we're historians, well, what was the movement like before Paul and without Paul? And sure. then what did it become once Paul comes along? And in my book, I suggest that there's quite a rift that Paul's well aware of. And I just quoted uh, the language. He said, I went up, I saw the so-called pillars of the church, James, Peter, John. What they are means nothing to me if they're not accepting that I got my message from Jesus himself. So that sets up uh, some conflict, I think. And then we do have a letter from James, whether James wrote it firsthand. It's actually pretty good Greek, uh, but it is attributed to him. It's certainly reflective of him. And I challenge anyone in your audience who's never read James, or even if you have read James, read Galatians for Paul, and then go read James. And what are you going to find? Other than two times where James refers to Jesus as the Messiah, which he apparently did believe that, I'm talking two, like two verses where he says, Hold not the faith of our Lord Jesus. He doesn't even say Christ there, just the rabbi, you know, the Lord Jesus, uh, in vain. If you took those out, it's a Jewish treatise. It could even be a Muslim treatise, not sure. on the Quran or anything like that, but just it's the most beautiful book on basic, what, Judeo-Jesus ethics. You know, right. the law, the prophets, this kind of thing. How do you treat the poor? Uh, should you defer to rich people? Uh, what about fervent prayer? And uh, what do you do when someone's sick and so forth? People need to read it. And then he says also, 
and he has to be referring to Paul. You know, you believe in God, but the devils also believe and tremble. Right. So faith without works is dead being alone. And everybody gets into this faith works thing. And look, James believes in grace. The Hebrew Bible believes in grace. The Quran believes in grace. Sure. But it's grace for your failures, your sins, your shortcomings, but not a license in any way to say, okay, everything's blotted out and you're now justified in the eyes of God. You're justified or declared not guilty as you repent of things, but it's an ongoing process according to James. So he talks about, you know, if you're going to fulfill the Torah, and he's talking about the Ten Commandments, basically. He names some of the commandments, you know, don't steal, don't lie, don't, don't commit adultery. He said, don't tell me you're a person of faith if you do these things. Now, Paul would agree with that. I'm not saying that Paul wouldn't agree. But Paul would also say, well, once you're in Christ, you're no longer under the law, he says. And you become part of this new covenant that actually supersedes the covenant, as it was called, of Moses and the prophets. And it has different kinds of stipulations. But I think the big thing with Paul is he thinks very soon everything is passing away. He says that. He says the form of this world is passing away. And in the coming new world to come, the spiritual world, all of these things that matter in our world like marriage like diet like all kinds of human relationships will be transcended by this heavenly glorification and in effect you're going to up to another world or beyond to another world and he says there won't be male or female there won't be jew or gentile there won't be slave or free there won't be rich or poor so all of these social ethnic religious, cultural distinct, uh, differences will pass away. And it seems like he wants to say, so let's live like that now if we can. That's an interesting point. Like getting, you're, you're, he's he's discarding all this stuff because he feels, I just say discarding, he's saying it's a higher, le a higher level of, a, of existence and it's, it's, it, it's imminent. And it's an interesting point that you're making, Val, because you're saying that he's, He's saying, "Let's live there. Let's live in that that moment now, because we're almost we're readying ourselves because it's in already it. not yet. I think I have a chapter already not yet. Already not yet. Like, yeah. We're already there. Not yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. And so it, it's it's it's, but we do you know now you know here we are looking back right. We know we know what happened in around thereabouts in seventy right when when uh, uh, the Romans uh, sacked uh, Jerusalem and. And uh, and Judaism became a rabbinic faith. The center ceases to be, uh, and and Paul has his satellites all over in, in in well all over, but in Asia Minor and 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 heading towards uh, Rome, and so the end wasn't near, right? Wasn't nigh. So yeah, it's a great disappointment, and you know, it's it, we find it in the Gospels. Uh, the the texts on the imminence of the end are very strong in the new testament in fact the book closes with the book of revelation last words of jesus even so i come quickly and uh one way to take that is oh jesus failed and he's not a prophet cuz you know that's a false prophecy and paul failed he said it was near he said, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Well, Paul didn't remain until the coming because because there hasn't been the coming. So people either go that route or now among Christians, there's a huge movement. I see it mostly on YouTube. It's not in the church as much, but it's uh, uh, essentially the idea of a kind of a full preterist view, they call it, that, well, all that did actually happen but more in the heavenly realm, meaning the kingdom but, is here, but it's the church. But then if you start reading the prophets and say, wait, I, I, Isaiah says uh, the wolf will dwell with the lamb and there'll be peace and justice and nations will put down their arms. That 
look at the past 2,000 years. I'm not sure we're in the kingdom of God. Or the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. When the kingdom of God comes, it breaks in pieces and destroys all these kingdoms and fills the earth. And Jesus talks about that, how, how the kingdom will grow and fill the earth. So Christianity began to take two approaches. One is that it is here, but it's not manifested yet on earth. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's an ongoing agenda, uh, sort of always waiting to be realized. But the judgment didn't come, the final judgment, the resurrection of the dead. Paul talks about the resurrection of the dead. Surely you don't allegorize that and say, well, that actually happened also. Because finally, language doesn't mean anything, you know, if you go that route. Paul says, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will rise to meet him in the clouds of heaven. So that, that's pretty literal, you know, <laughs> and the Lord will appear and all nations will see him and the judgment will come and he'll defeat the Antichrist and so forth. So Paul believed all that. None of it happened. And yet... Uh, that gets put aside because of the great theological things that he said in terms of what Christianity was. But where the controversy really, if we could go back to the 40s and 50s, which we can't really, the 40s and about 10, 20 years after Jesus, we think we can reconstruct something very interesting. And that is a group that later gets called the Ebionites, the poor ones. Yeah literally it's often characterized as jewish christianity it would be the wing of the group that was more oriented around james the brother of jesus and peter and the original apostles and what we find in some second and third century documents which don't go back to the first century and i'm not saying they do but they're reflective of debates and arguments that a character that is a stand-in for Paul, he's called Simon Magus uh, in the text, but he's everybody knows it's Paul. And then James and the apostles are debating. And one of the things they say to him is, well, we were with Jesus. Right. We heard him. We talked to him. We know what he taught. Now, you claim you've talked to him. And you've heard him, and you're bringing us sort of the latest word, you might say. But how do we know that what you saw was a vision from God? You know, shouldn't we go by what we got directly from him? So you begin to get this dichotomy that you get in lots of religions once the founder dies. Do you have subsequent revelations that could supersede and be added to the body of material you have from the founder or do you stick with the foundation of what you have and i think the ebionites represent a group that rejected paul we like how do you even imagine such a thing that there was a version of the christian faith if you want to call it christian they wouldn't like the word christian but christian means messianic you know christos so Let's call it the Messianic faith. There's a version of the Jesus Messianic faith that sees Paul as an enemy of the gospel, not a friend, and also believes that Paul corrupted the faith and that you should go back to the original teachings of James and look to him. And that's what you see in the Gospel of Thomas. It doesn't say go to Paul. It says go to James, you know, in that term. Well, and, and it's a very Islamic thought, you know, the idea of Hazadisa and there's the 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 New Testament is a is the Injal you know, is corrupt as a corrupted document. And the, there's a book of sayings that's yet to to be discovered that that is you know close to like the Gnostic uh what would be the Gnostic gospels, you know, that they're, they're saying something like right. that that exists. And so it's a it's a, an interesting offshoot into the Jew yeah. from the Jewish Jesus and movement into a really interesting thing that the Ebionites say. And remember, we're only getting what they say from their enemies. People hate them because they represent a very alternative direction. But one of the things they do is they quote that parable of the wheat and the tares. 
remember Jesus tells a story about a field and uh, the good owner sows it with good seed for a great crop, a pure crop. And an evil person comes in and sows worthless grain that looks just like wheat but or barley, but it's not. It's called tares in English. And it comes up together and you can't tell the difference. And they say, that's what Paul did. He came into the movement and sowed these false seeds. And therefore, God will have to sort it out at the end. And they see Paul actually as an enemy of the faith. And then if you say, well, what about the New Testament? As you said, they say, well, that's been corrupted. There are true elements within the New Testament, like the book of James, like some of the teachings of Jesus are fine. But when they get mixed in, like, did Jesus say, drink my blood and eat my body, even symbolically? Would a Jew have even thought of such a thing as a symbol? Don't we know that more from Greek religions or the magical papyri or something like that? Sure. But Paul said, he, Paul says, and when he introduces that, 1 Corinthians 11, I receive from the Lord. He means Jesus. Yeah. And now I'm giving it to you that the Last Supper is taking bread and wine, which is done at any Jewish meal, right? The blessing of the bread and the wine. And uh, he said, this is my body. This is my blood. Drink it, eat it. Well, I could see Paul saying that. I have real trouble thinking of James saying that. And then we go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, because remember, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a contemporary Messianic movement, not following Jesus, I don't think. I don't think they're Christian. But they have a Eucharist ceremony in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was found in Cave One. It's called the Messianic Banquet. And it tells about how the Messiah is going to come, and the priest, and they will break the bread and then share the wine, but there's nothing about, you know, body and blood of your God or anything like that. And also calling Jesus God, uh, that becomes more and more prevalent in a way as these New Testament writings go on. And by the way, in the seven letters of Paul, I don't think he thinks of Jesus as God, which would really surprise Trinitarians. What he says is for us, this is Paul, 1 Corinthians 8, there's one God and one Lord Jesus, one master. Lord means master, uh, kurios. Uh, it's, it's almost like saying sir in Greek, you know, kurios. In fact, you can call a human Lord, meaning sir, sir, sir. So there's one boss. And uh, I, I think... Paul would remain pretty much a monotheist. But Paul's followers began to talk about Jesus. He's preexistent. Uh, and even the passage in Philippians that I do think Paul wrote. Let me try something with you uh, on that. Uh, it talks about though he is in the form of God, Jesus, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself and took on the form of a man. Now, later Christians read that, and they go, oh, look, Jesus is God. He's in heaven with God, and then he in the incarnation. That's Paul must have believed that. That's one of his early letters. It is an authentic letter. But if you look about, who was it that was in the form of God and was told by Satan, if you eat this fruit, you'll become equal with God? It's, yeah, it's, it's Adam. Adam. So he's actually talking about an Adam Christology, we call it, right. which is not, I'm in heaven divine, I give it up, and then I get to go back and be exalted even more. Rather, an Adam made in the image of God, humans are in the image of God, image of God yeah. but instead of grasping for equality, meaning I'm going to take it, I'm going to grab it, he became a servant, it says, a servant, giving to others, serving. And therefore, God exalted him. Yeah. Now, that becomes a pattern that Paul believes will be applied to all of us. He says, everybody forgets the verse he says before that, have this mind in you, which Jesus had, meaning you too should not grasp to be equal with God. So he's teaching good, strong, monotheistic faith there. Right. So yeah. I don't think he totally rejected uh, the Ebionites just, don't like him because he 
says you don't have to keep the Torah and you don't have to, uh, you have to you maintain know, the law, all the yeah. commandments. You can eat anything you want. I mean, Paul does say, look, eat what's set before you. Don't ask any questions unless somebody might object. Right. He says the earth is the Lord's. All food is good. Well, observant Jews and Gentiles, remember, are not supposed to eat blood. Yeah. Gentiles as well as Jews. That's not just a Jewish law. That's in uh, Genesis 9. So this abstaining from things strangled and from blood is has to do with cruelty to animals. That you don't just go like knock an animal in the head with a club and rip it open or something like that. You have to kill it in a painless way is, is the idea Uh I'm vegetarian, so I'm not going to get into either way, but it's easier to be vegetarian than... Well, we 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 we'll probably have to go into it. We can, uh, our next talk, you can talk about the religion of, of vegetarianism, the faith of vegetarianism. We can get into <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but Paul, So, Paul, what I'm saying is uh, these Pauline, these non-Pauline people, the poor ones, the Ebionites... Sure. They don't think Jesus is God. They, they think the New Testament is corrupt. They don't think Paul had a better revelation superseding James. And we do know that they migrated into the Arabian Peninsula. Um, Paul himself talks about going to Arabia, probably the Aravah, whether it's Saudi Arabia or just, he, he calls it the Aravah. And my Muslim friends who do accept a very, very high inspiration of the Quran, and most Muslims do, don't like to talk about influences, like the Prophet Muhammad cannot be influenced by the Ebionites, uh, because that would be the approach of many scholars. You know, like Muhammad, he was, he was around a different kind of Christian. He was around Constantinian Christians, of sure, course. Sure. But he also knew another version of Christianity that's more authentic, that he would consider more authentic. That is, it's not idolatrous. It stays with the one God. It doesn't say that God impregnated Mary, you know, in some sort of a typical Christian view of sure. incarnation. There's God doesn't have a son in that sense. Uh, and uh, also that it... Uh, believes that the writings have been corrupted. So it, many scholars uh, have argued in the Western world that early stages of Islam were in contact with these Ebionite versions of Christianity in which there would be more compatibility. I'm not an expert on that, but I know Robert Eisenman and others, you know, have written about it. Yeah, you know, Mustafa Akol and I, we, we, we kind of espouse similar views because it's... Uh the idea of this diaspora, you know, moving south and, and east. Uh, and, and there is some archaeological evidence, you know, uh, and I don't think it contradicts uh, any revelation, any, any you know, the, uh, that the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had with, with, uh, with Jibreel. But uh, I think that the, it just makes it more uh, likely uh, and ripe for when the, the final revelation came down. Uh, you could, you could, you had, you had a, a group of people that already thought and 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 kind of could chew on on the idea of of Islam in a much more um, much more equitable and 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 digest it better uh, because that's what they already believed mm -hmm. in the Jewish Jesus movement. You know that, that my grandfather, great grandfather, would always say this. He'd say, uh, you know, we we believe in Abrahamic lineage. You know, and he would go all the way back through. <laughs> they'd say the. The Islam is the, the the bloodline to the end of days, and he'd say that priesthood was restored by the Christians, the Jewish Jesus movement. He actually would say that, and then he'd go back and say, you know, the word was given to us by uh, to the Israelites, and he 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 make this sort of this sort of this argument uh, of Abrahamic lineage, and I think that 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 evolution in the maybe Ebonite uh, diaspora or. Uh, uh, is 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 it show? They're starting to show more evidence, particularly from the our archaeological perspective. But and I think more research needs to be done on that. But I think that there's a there's an opportunity there. Um, but I know we're heading on an hour here, and I know that that you have some some well, family I'll business. Mention, I'll, I'll mention something else that might be interesting. Um, you know this testimony of Jesus that's in Josephus that's so famous. Yes. Uh, 
it's in the antiquities, the later work that he wrote. Chapter, and I think it's book uh, 18, as I recall. And it says things like, I can, I'll just barely quote it. Uh, At that time, there arose a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. Okay. Right. And then he did this and this. And when you read it in Greek today, it sounds like, well, Josephus, he's a Christian. I mean, there's no way he could have said this kind of thing about Jesus. Like he's listened to by all those who know the truth and so forth. And he was raised from the dead. And so we have an Arabic version of that. This would be some indication of what you're talking about. Uh, we have an Arabic version of that. Uh, preserved more from Muslim sources. And it doesn't have... Literally, you could go through with a red line and cross out the heavy Christological stuff. At that time, there arose a wise man right. who taught the people, blah, blah, blah. And it's just a straightforward description of what we would think would be pretty much the historical Jesus. Sure. And so the Arabic version of Josephus, that passage, doesn't have those Christological additions. So that would be an indication that even Josephus, the Jewish historian, is circulating in different regions of the world, whereas the Christians preserved the Greek version, not the Jews. People right. don't know this. The Jews did not preserve Josephus. The Greek copies of Josephus are coming from Christians. Sure. Why do they love it? Because of that passage. They go, yeah. look, this, this guy is a witness to the divinity of Jesus. You know, you can't even call him a man because he's he's so divine. And yet, uh, here's an example. Uh, and I have a website, jamestabor.com, that I think you'll put into your descriptions and so forth. And uh, there's a document I have in there. It's called The Christians as the Romans Saw Them. And they, you can search and find it real easy you know, on that website. And I give you that Arabic passage in English, and you can kind of see. And uh, so I do think there are versions of the faith that have been lost to us of, of the Jesus. I like to call it the Jesus movement. Esau. Esau. Yeah, Esau. You know, Esau and, movement. And in other words, it's the Jesus movement and what he was like and what his brother was like in their own time, in their own day, outside of Paul, or better said, what was made of Paul, because I don't want to blame Paul for everything. You know, he's not responsible for people later writing letters in his name and interpolating and pushing sure. him in directions that he would have never gone. He is so sure that apocalyptic is so you 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 called it imminent. I, I'm talking, we're talking about you know. I think like if he wrote First Corinthians seven, we think around fifty one A.D. He probably thinks by sixty at the latest, it's going to be all over. He's not anticipating history going on. So you have to kind of capture him in a moment of time. But when you make him the great theologian who now is going to be the pillar of Christian theology for all time and places, that's a use of the material that I think is ahistorical. Right. Uh, you know, he it, himself, it, if he could read Colossians, Ephesians, some of those other letters, I would think he would be like, what? <laughs> you said that Jesus created the world? And he's now the creator God? <laughs> You know, as I, I said a lot of stuff, but you know, this is crazy because I, I, he's he is he is out there. You know, when it comes to the idea of it, of, of yeah, he, having he, a, he broadly fits within certain versions of Judaism that believe it's moving into the Messianic age. Right. <laughs> and if you're moving into the Messianic age, you can find a more universality, maybe. You know, I, I, like I, said, I appreciate making this distinction and taking the time because I tell you, it's there, there's your book and and uh, and and the ideas and the, and, the, and the, that you put with you know chapter by chapter, but the idea of unpacking this in a, in a with a narrative uh, that 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 walks us through the idea of Paul in his day, uh, the intention I think is is such a wonderful compendium uh, to this uh, to you to your book. 
I, I appreciate you taking the time. I want to be yeah, sensitive. Well, let's I know talk you got again. Some we'll explore more specifically some of the areas uh, that have to do with Paul and early Christianity. And we should actually do a program on what do we know about James and how do we know it and actually uh, get out the sources. And I would love to do that. Thanks so much.